Psalm 13. We're actually going to wrap up a series today. This will be the last in this series that we've been working on, on learning how to um, hear God speak. We learn, it's a process of learning to identify God's voice, hear him speak into our lives, and then uh, following uh, after what God says to us. Um, So today I want to end with what seems like an odd way to end that series. It it is, um, praise team kind of intimated at this, um, but what happens when God is silent? What happens when you've been listening, but it's just a big silence that you seem to be getting from God? Um, I love the scriptures because they tell us what it feels like. Real people who've experienced this. David, who felt this way. Psalm 13. This is God's word. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, so listen for the Holy Spirit to speak. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Let's take a moment just to pray. Holy Spirit, help us. Give us ears to hear. Give us a sensitivity to your Holy Spirit right now, Father, that that we would respond, um, that we would really be active listeners. God, we long to know your voice because you change us for our very best. You love us. And so speak to us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have walked with Jesus any length of time, and some of you, um, I did this at the first service, but I'm looking right now, some of you have walked with Jesus a long time. And if you've walked with Jesus any length of time, you will hit at some point. It's been my experience that every person I've ever talked to who has at some point experienced this, this silence of heaven. This, I I am praying. I I am listening for God. I go to worship and I'm reading my scriptures and I have my devotional time and, but it's like just this big black emptiness. I, I don't hear God speak. And I think our psalm right away tells us that what do you do when it feels like I've gone through the sermon series and I've I've looked at all the ways that God speaks but none of them are working what do you do the psalm tells us the first thing to do is keep praying but pray in truth pray the reality of your frustration that it's not only okay but it's good to pray our frustration and our angst to God our anger even. Some Christians over the years, uh, the centuries have called this the, the dark night of the soul, where life goes along and God is good and you've seen God work, but you hit this period, the prayers seem to be bouncing off the ceilings. It's just, it's, some people call it like walking through a desert wilderness because it feels like you are alone and God is not helping, God's not present. Where would God go? Why would he leave me like this? But to pray that is important. Not just to think it, not just to feel it, but like to take it in an active, intentional way and say, God, I'm addressing this to you even though you haven't spoken to me for a while and it feels like you're not even listening, but by faith I'm going to pray this, but it's it's a prayer of anguish. And you hear this not just in Psalm 13, it's throughout the Psalms. You see all kinds of Psalms and other scriptures that say this, God, will you forget me forever? Don't turn a deaf ear to me. If you remain silent, I might as well give up and die, is what the psalmist says. God, don't be silent. Don't be deaf. Don't be quiet. Don't you hear and can't you see? Job says, I cry to you, O God, for help, and you do not answer me. You have become cruel to me. That's a pretty honest prayer, isn't it? 
You've become cruel to me. I know for some of you, you will say, that's, that's not quite right. You shouldn't pray that way because it sounds irreverent. We're supposed to honor, be in awe of God's holiness. How can we, mere creatures, speak to God in that way? God, I think you're being cruel to me right now. Not only do you not care, you actively seem to be making my life miserable. And some of you are afraid to pray that way because you're afraid if I pray that way, I'm going to go outside and all four of my tires are going to be flat and I'm going to wake up tomorrow with leprosy and zits and all kinds of stuff on me and that's going to be like God saying, yeah, you dare not talk to me that way. And God is not like that. I know we are sinful. Somebody offends us and we give them what? The silent treatment, right? That's our passive aggressive way of sinning against other people. Fine, I'm not going to talk to you. Hands off. God is not like that. God loves us. But in the silence, what do we do? We pray, and God is not too offended. I take great courage in the fact that our view of the Scriptures is what? That it's not just another book. We have a very high view of Scripture here at First Christian, which is we believe it's written by normal human beings, ordinary human beings, but inspired by the Holy Spirit so that what we have is not just some thoughts about God. It is actually the revealed Word of God to us. And that means a lot when you read these kinds of scriptures. When Job cries out, you're being cruel to me. I can imagine the Holy Spirit inspired him. Think about that. The Holy Spirit inspired him to say, God is being cruel to me. That maybe, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired and then father and son come along and say, hey, maybe we should edit that. You know, maybe that part shouldn't go in. That doesn't make us look too good. God is not at all offended or concerned or worried if we are honest to him. Now, if we don't, if we don't take it to him in prayer, well, that's a different matter. Then God, his glory is being diminished. His glory is not diminished when we respond with great honesty because it reflects the truth of who God really is, a God of love and grace and a God who says, that's a good prayer. That's a good prayer to pray. And that's where we start Yeah, but it's still silent. Now what? I want to offer you two, and I want to be cautious here. I'm going to give you two, what I think, possible reasons if you're going through a period where God is silent. They may not apply in every situation, but they might. We have to troubleshoot, don't we? I'm not hearing God at all. What could be wrong? I'm going to give you two possible reasons that are blocking our ability to hear God speak And then at the end, I want to give you one good reason why you can have confidence that God is going to break the silence, okay? So let me give you these first two. The first one here, possible reason. If we're not hearing God speak, we should all, and we should do this every day anyway, but especially when when God seems silent, examine our hearts for unconfessed sin. The scriptures say, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart, that turns away from the living God. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So something happens when we're not confessing our sin, that our hearts get a little kind of a hardened shell to them. And God might be trying to speak, and God is speaking, but we're not hearing it. And it's primarily because disobedience, which is what unconfessed sin is, disobedience means I've already heard God say something, and I've chosen to ignore it. See, that's what my disobedience means. God says, this is how I want you to live, and for whatever reason, I look at it and I say, no, I don't, wanna, I don't want to do that. Well, I've already taken God speaking, but I've now kind of put a block to it. I don't want to hear that because I want to do what I want to do. And suddenly our hearts get hardened. I say use this with caution because Job who had a great silence in his life. Read the book of Job. It's a long book, 40-some chapters. You get Job at the very beginning, his life is good and falls apart in a hurry, but he doesn't know why. All he gets is silence. He gets no word from God through many, many, many chapters. It's only to the very end of the book that God speaks. And so Job goes through this terrible silence, and then he has friends who come along, and they say, it could be, I heard Pastor Cliff give a sermon on this one time. It could be, un- I think it's unconfessed sin. The problem was they didn't say it might be unconfessed sin. They said, Job, it is unconfessed sin. The only reason you can't hear God speak is because you're a sinner and haven't confessed it. 
And God reveals by the end of the book that they're wrong. The silence is not because Job has unconfessed sin. So we're cautious with this, and at the same time, I know that there are times in my life where I have, uncon- I have unconfessed sin because I want to go my way. Well, there's no reason I should expect to hear God speak if I've already disobeyed him on what he said. And so we have to check our hearts. Did you know, you ever go to the doctor, I'm not picking on doctors this morning, but you go to the doctor and they say, you are way too stressed. You got too much going on in your life. You got to pull back a little bit. You got to kind of get the stress out of your life and relax a little bit, get some rest, eat properly, get some good sleep. You're just, you got too much going on in your life. You ever hear a doctor say that to you? Mayo Clinic did a study. How many doctors do you think are overstressed and, and they don't eat right and they're on the run too much? 40% is what Mayo Clinic did a little study and they're like, 40% of the doctors who are telling everybody, you guys need to slow down a little bit, don't slow down. Why? Because we don't have ears to hear. By the way, not to pick on doctors, because pastors, we tell you, you guys to slow down, you're, over, you're really stressed, you gotta, you gotta get some rest, you gotta pull back. Pastors, we're 50%. It's not, we're worse than the doctors, right? We'll tell you and then we're not doing it ourselves because 50%, I'm wrong all the time, right? You know, I mean, I'm, I do the same thing. I don't have ears to hear what I'm saying. There has to come a point where I say, God, is that the problem? Is that what's happening? I need to confess. It's okay. We're all gonna need this. Jesus in the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, built in that confession Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us is connected to daily asking for bread. So we ought to be doing it every day. It's a chance to come clean and be able to hear more clearly. Check that one. Or check this one. What's going on with your body? Because body and soul is what were created. And both matter. Both absolutely matter. Jesus, on the night that he's going to be arrested and betrayed, goes into the garden, and he says to his disciples, this is the most critical point right here. Salvation hangs on this night right here because I'm looking at the cup of God's wrath, and I have to decide if I'm going to drink it or not. And it's a terrible thing. In fact, I'm asking the Father, isn't there another way? I need you guys to be praying with me. This is a critical moment, fellas. Pray with me. And then we see in Matthew 26... And then he returned to the disciples and he found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. What is happening in your body is connected to what is going on in your soul. It's not this simplistic kind of, well, if I've got this going on, it means something's wrong because my body did this. But there is a connection. There's a real connection between these. And to take that seriously in two ways. It means don't neglect your body and don't overindulge your body. Don't neglect your body. A new study, I was just reading it this week. Parents, some explanation for you. We have some, we've got our parents uh, here today who... They tell me that this is very true. You have what they call brain fog. Do you ever hear this? Parents have brain fog. You know what it is? It's this, uh, this tiredness because parents are exhausted because your kids suck the life out of you a little bit more each day and you don't get enough sleep and you're always on the run. You're moving them from here to here. You're driving them everywhere and you're exhausted. And, and they tell me that what happens is literally because of the exhaustion that parents lose the ability to concentrate. They lose the ability to make good decisions because you're so tired in your body, it affects your mind. They call it brain fog. Parents call it the fog of war, right? I mean, that's what's happening up here is that all of this stuff in my kids, so that when your kid comes along and they say, Dad, can, can I go ahead and take that gasoline and those explosives and play with those outside? And you're like, go ask your mother. And, and then they say, well, I asked mom already and she said to ask you. And then you're like, the, the brain fog is there, and you're like, yeah, just be quiet about it, right? Because like, you can't make decisions. You're so, so tired. You know, in the scriptures, in Luke's gospel, it says Jesus came back, and they were sleeping because, it's, Luke tells us, they were exhausted from sorrow. Their bodies 
were just at such a point they just could not even stay awake to pray at a most critical moment. We reject strongly the world's culture that tells us that our significance is tied to our busyness. The busier I am, the more important I must be because no one would be this busy unless I had some kind of value or importance attached to my life. And we reject that strongly. The world will have you running from the day you're born to the day you die trying to make yourself feel like you have worth by being busy. But here's something else. We reject strongly Christian culture that says, but it's okay to burn out for Jesus. It's okay to go ahead and run yourself ragged and say it must be okay because it's for God. I love how Jesus, some of my favorite verses, Mark 6, 31. Jesus, because there's so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, that's the disciples, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. How many of you right now, if you could hear one thing from Jesus this morning, would love to hear Jesus say, hey, stop what you're doing. Come with me by yourself to a quiet place, and we're going to get some rest. Jesus actually stops them from ministering. Jesus stops them from doing good things. They're serving people. They're helping people's needs. But at some point, Jesus just says, stop, fellas. Jesus, there's more people here. We got more to do. Your body is at its limit, and I've got to take you away to do what? Rest. Sabbath rest. Rest for body and soul. And I know I've said this a thousand times here, but it's so true. Sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can be doing is taking a nap. That's the most spiritual thing. And yes, I mean this, including during Pastor Cliff's sermon. If that's the best time, if that's the moment where God, you hear Jesus say, come with me to a quiet place by yourself, you're going to get some rest. I don't judge you at all. I know I see everything that's going on out there. There's a lot of drama out there some Sundays. But I'm telling you, I don't judge you. There are four stages of sleep. When you get to the third stage, your breathing slows down and sometimes your mouth begins to relax and there begins to be a little bit of a drool that starts to form here and starts to come down. I do not judge you. In fact, I just take that to be Jesus' words, the very scriptures that says, out of them will flow living waters, right? I mean, that's what's happening in that moment. I don't judge that at all. The fourth stage of sleep is REM sleep. You know, when you really go down and now all of your voluntary muscles relax completely. And sometimes you get that little bit of a head bob, right? Where you're going like this and then you're going like this. And I don't judge you at all. I just look at that and says, yes, the scriptures say yes and amen is every promise in Christ. They're just saying, yes, preach on, Cliff. And so I preach on, right? I don't judge that at all because honestly, sleep is so minimized in the culture when it is a gift from God. Why? Because then you'll have ears to hear. You can't hear if you're exhausted. Don't neglect your body. And I'm not recommending that you come to church and bring your Bible and your CPAP, you know? I'm I'm not recommending that. I mean, we're not gonna give out complimentary pillows at the Welcome Center or anything like that. I'm just saying, when that sleep comes, Take it as a gift from Jesus and then say, now, God, that you've refreshed me, give me ears to hear. On the other hand, don't overindulge your body. And yes, I mean, I think it does matter to get to have a good diet and to have some exercise. So don't have a bad diet, poor exercise, poor activity. But I also mean don't overindulge your body in the way that some people do, which is to have such an obsessive focus with our bodies Oh, you're in great tip-top shape, but the body gets elevated beyond what God intended and suddenly it becomes the most important thing in our lives. And either one of those extremes is going to keep us from really hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying. Paul wrote, I discipline my body, this is 1 Corinthians 9, like an athlete, training it to do what it should 
Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might be disqualified. No, my body matters in this whole deal of walking with Jesus and listening for the Holy Spirit. And you know, if you want one real quick exercise you can work on, if you're like, I, wanna, I don't want to neglect my body, I don't want to overindulge it, how can I practice that? How can I practice not overindulging my body? Fasting. It's a spiritual discipline. It's talked about in the scriptures in lots and lots of places. It is not how to lose weight. Scriptural uh, and biblical reasons for fasting are not to lose weight. It's not a diet of some kind. It is simply saying food is a good gift from God, but I'm going to purposefully forego eating when my body indicates that it's hungry. And the reason I do that is because I have to practice kind of speaking back to my body. You ever have your body, you, have, you get a belly growl, and you don't think, you don't talk about it, you don't pray through it. It's like, it, I've got to get something because my belly just told me to. My belly commanded me. I better go eat. When what fasting does is it says, my body has lots of desires and urges, but I will not be mastered by any of them. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to practice this, Lord. And the worst of me is probably going to rise to the surface because I get hangry for Jesus, but I get hangry, right? I, I, get, I get pretty angry. Oh, that's because my body has learned that whenever I tell you to jump, you jump. And instead I say, no, there's a Lord who's greater than you. You're good. You're a good gift. But don't elevate a good gift beyond what it's meant to be. So we fast and we pray and we can hear God. The, the scriptures talk about this. The church at Antioch, when they sent Paul and Barnabas out, what were they doing? They were praying and fasting. And in the fasting, they have a clarity that maybe wasn't there before. Maybe that's what the Holy Spirit might prompt you to do. Lastly, what's hope? What's the hope here? If you really are in a time, a dark night of your soul, and you say, I have been in this way too long, longer than your sermon series on hearing God speak. Big black hole when I pray. Everything goes in, nothing comes out. Psalm 130, verse 6 says, I wait for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. And then emphasizes it, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Watchmen in ancient cities were critical people to have for the, for the safety of the city. They would have watchmen on the walls. They would have lookouts. They would basically look out. The problem is, <clears throat> this is time before electricity, you have a watchman on the wall at night. At night, you can hardly see anything. Imagine if there were no other ambient light. It gets really dark. A watchman on the wall is watching, but he's mostly listening because he's listening in the dark. Is that a band of raiders coming to the town? I better sound the alarm. Is that something happening in the vineyards? I better sound the alarm. He's listening. It's an active listening. So when it says wait on the Lord, it's not just sit around twiddle your thumbs. It's this active listening like a watchman who's listening and waiting. And I'm just trying to make sure that I'm not missing anything. The interesting thing with watchmen is they had no way in the ancient days to tell time. They primarily used sundials to tell time. At night, you got no way to tell what time it is. You have no way to mark time. That means a watchman on the wall is saying, are we done? It's kind of ironic, but watchmen never had watches, right? They, they never had clocks. They never had any way to say, are we almost there yet? Or are we almost done? Their hope was this. Yeah, but at some point, I don't know when, at some point, right over that horizon, the sun is going to start to rise. And it says, boy, the watchmen wait and hope for that like nobody else. Why? Because they're exhausted. They're tired. They've been waiting and waiting, trying to actively listen. And all the way, they're just waiting. But one point, the sun is coming. The sun is coming. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. Lord, I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to actively listen for you. They know the sun is going to rise. What gives us confidence that your silence is going to be broken? That God, will speak, that God will speak. Well, we've seen it before. They know the sun 
rises. I've seen it before. Well, we've seen it before. You know what a really bad silence was one time? Mary and Martha and Lazarus, their sisters and brother, really, really close with Jesus. It's described that they have this closeness, this deep friendship between the family and Jesus. Lazarus gets sick. Jesus isn't there at the time. Lazarus gets deathly sick. Mary and Martha send word, quick, get Jesus. Jesus has healed so many people. Get Jesus to come. And the scriptures tell us in John 11, really crazy thing. Jesus gets the word and waits two days. Silence. He doesn't send word back. He doesn't say to the messenger, let him know I'm, I'm trying to get there. I've got to wrap up some things. No, just silence. That had to be the most agonizing couple of days of silence for Mary and Martha. Where is he? He's, he's going to die. Why is Jesus waiting? And then he dies. Silence. And then finally Jesus shows up after a terrible silence. And when he comes, the hurt has already been building. You can see it in the text when you look at this in John 11. Martha comes out. Mary is so mad. She's so upset with Jesus, she won't even come out and see him. Martha goes out and she says, if you had been here, if you hadn't been silent, but now it's too late because the silence has robbed us of joy in our lives. If you had only been here. Oh, but Martha, don't don't you believe? Yes, I know. At the end of all things, yeah, resurrection, that's going to be great. I am the resurrection, Jesus says. I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, oh, that's the belief. And then Martha sends word for Mary, and Mary comes, and the best she can do is just sob. She is weeping, the text says, when she comes to Jesus. And she croaks out the same words as Martha, her sister. If you had only been here, if you had not left this deep, cutting silence in my life, then life would have been okay. But it's too late now. And I love what Jesus does. He doesn't go into a big lesson. First, he weeps with them. He cries with them. (laughs) I love that Jesus would spend time to cry with us. And you say, well, that's great, but I would much rather he would do something than just cry with me. But I want to tell you, when you're in the darkness and you're hurting, it really makes a difference to know that God himself is weeping with you. And then he does more. Then he says, I'm going to break the silence. Lazarus, come out, and all life changes. And I want to tell you something. If you're in a silence right now, you are primed and ready for an experience of God speaking that won't just be, well, that was great, God spoke to me. It will change your life. Because I guarantee you this, Mary and Martha and certainly Lazarus are not the same after God breaks the silence. It has been a brutal silence, but when it happens, when God speaks, they say, now I can see. Oh, this this word that you speak is greater than any word I could have ever imagined, but it only happens out of the silence. And the powerful thing is, if you're in a silence right now, God is prepping you for the opportunity when he speaks, will change you. It will be a powerful word in your life. And God knows what it's like because you know what the deepest silence ever was? The deepest silence of God ever. The Son of God is hanging on the tree. Why have you forsaken me? He calls out. The Son of God calls to the Father. Why have you forsaken me? And what is God's response? Silence. No word is spoken to Jesus on the cross. And for the first time in all eternity, the Son of God who has always enjoyed eternal fellowship between Father and Son and Spirit is crying out and he's saying, 
I don't, I don't sense you. I don't feel you. I don't hear you, God. There's this deep, deep silence, and it's crushing me. Why have you forsaken me? And God doesn't speak on Friday. And on Saturday, it's interesting. What is Saturday? Sabbath, rest. On Saturday, God doesn't speak. It's silent. In fact, the, the gospel writers tell us that other people are doing things, but there's no word about what the disciples are talking about. Why? It's just silence. But then, the watchmen say, it's Sunday morning. I think I see the sun. I th- I'm pretty sure that's light starting to rise on the horizon. I think God is going to speak. And then the most powerful word that's ever been spoken. He's risen. He is risen. Out of the darkness, out of the silence, comes this powerful word that changes lives, has been changing lives to this very day. In this very sanctuary, lives have been changed because there was the deepest silence ever broken by the word of God that said, he is risen. It hurts when you're in that dark night of the soul. But I want to tell you, there is real hope As the watchmen look for the morning, as sure as that's going to happen, God will break your silence. Let's listen for him. Let's pray.